وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين um, I begin by extending all my condolences to the families of those who were lost in the terrible tragedy even though it's halfway across the world the ummah as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said is like one single body if a part of the body is in pain then the entire body is in pain and so we're all in pain right now um, and we also have members of our community who the degrees of separation from the people who experience this tragedy is not very far uh, Sheikh Ala al-Din al-Bakri um, knows if you've seen the picture of the man who was on the stretcher holding up his finger he's a Palestinian brother from he may, he survived he from Gaza and he's the brother-in-law or he's the brother of a sister who's in the Saratoga and the West Valley community so he knows him directly and then Imam Fahim also shared with us that one of the victims was his neighbor in India his direct right next door so the 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 feeling in the community here is we have the umma feeling but we also have people who are experiencing a more direct um uh, more direct direct pain and so what we're doing here is really as a as as that part of the umma saying how are we going to deal with that pain the pain is on one side of the body we're on the other side of the body we're feeling the pain how should we deal with that how should we react to that how should we prepare in the future should something like this again occur la qadar allah god forbid what do we do now what do we do in the future how do we speak to our children about it how do we speak to uh, our co-workers about it what what do we do in this type of situation um so with this i'll hand it off to dr rania who will um, speak a little bit about um the the reaction and how to speak to the family and also can speak about the khalil center and what services that they can offer one of the things that the khalil center has been doing is having a crisis response team and so going out into communities and helping uh people process what is going on and what in the news that they hear because we have to remember that not only do we get uh do people who are directly affected by tragedies experience trauma but you can experience trauma from reading the news from hearing about it and especially for the 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 younger ones amongst us in our community are especially our children as they hear things how are they supposed to process it one of the things that was also sent out maybe uh, how many of you uh, received the email from noorkids.com brother amir amin uh raise your hand if you got those email i would encourage everybody who's not familiar with noorkids even if you don't have kids yourself please um look at their research they did a lot of research in this community um with some of the the muslims who are in both public schools and private schools and also in other communities they've moved away from this area uh but they were doing graduate school i believe at berkeley um so they um one of the things that they found in studying for 400 muslim kids is that a lot of people are going through uh difficulties in this country with identity and, uh, and some of the reaction it's either assimilation the way they're coping with it as an unhealthy coping mechanism is either assimilating like dropping their muslim identity trying to blend in or resistance fighting turning into fighting and turning into anger so now the question is especially for the the youth and those who are forming their identity in this climate of anti-islam and islamophobia and so forth how do we help them form a strong muslim identity without assimilating and dropping their muslim identity and without turning to a path of 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 resistance Assalamu alaikum Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala sayidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in Inshallah I'll begin also by offering my condolences to the community both the ummah at large and all the members of the community here who have been affected directly and all of us at some level have been affected subhanallah this is such difficult news to hear and today in our discussion like sheikh rami said he's speaking for much more of the pragmatic and also the um what next steps looking forward in our communities do we take to really protect ourselves and to protect our children while still keeping hold of that islamic identity um and that pride that comes with our muslim identity i'll be taking the conversation in a different direction right now where i'm going to speak more on how we're doing and coping with the news what happens when we're suddenly hit with some really difficult news and when um and how we cope and how that directly affects how our children are doing as well 
Since on Friday nights, typically what we have here offered at the MCC, because we have all of our youth groups happening for the boys and girls, typically the audience on a Friday night are parents, the mother's halakha and the father's halakha. So today I'm going to address you as parents. But even for non-parents, you have nieces and nephews, you have people around you who are young and who are struggling, and you yourselves are struggling as well. So all of what I'm going to mention will be beneficial to everybody, inshallah ta'ala. But I really wanted to emphasize the part about the youth and our engagement with them. When I think about the prophetic wisdom of how you engage children, particularly in times of distress, we have so many wonderful examples. And one of my favorite, as you all probably know by now, is a hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, is talking to a very young companion, a child. And in this uh, narration, which is the hadith, is actually quite short. And in it, the Prophet وسلم, recognizes, he enters into the home of this family, recognizes that this child is grieving and in distress. Something is wrong. He's not doing well. And as busy as the Prophet is, and as so much is happening in the Ummah and taking care of all the matters of the Ummah, he still recognizes what's happening with this child. And then he asks the people of the household, what's wrong with the child? And so they tell him. And then the Prophet, our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, approaches the child with so much gentleness and asks the child in a very beautiful hadith, do you know this hadith that I'm referring to? This companion, this Sahabi, he was very young, but we still call him a Sahabi because he lived, he was a contemporary of the Prophet he lived in the same time period, but he was a child. And in this narration, we learn that his name is Aba Umayr. And the Prophet وسلم, goes to him and says, Ya Aba Umayr, O Aba Umayr, ma fa'ala nughayr. What did the nughayr do? And the Nughayr, if you can listen to the name Umayr and Nughayr, you see that they're rhyming. And you also understand that the Prophet in his eloquence is able to take, subhanAllah, right there on the spot, take the name of the boy, rhyme it with the name of a little bird. <laughs> he had learned that the boy had lost his pet bird. And that's why he was so sad and upset. And he clearly showed it. And when the Prophet heard this from the family members, he didn't just dismiss it and go, oh, it's just the pet, moving on. No, he actually was tuned into the child and was able to what? go to him and look at how he actually asked the question. He asked him, oh, Aba Umayr, what did the nulayr, what did the bird do? Not what did you do to the bird, <laughs> right? And so, and nor did he dismiss it, and nor did he belittle it, nor did he minimize it, nor did he blame him. And this is really important when we talk about children, and we talk about their emotions, and we talk about how they're doing, and being tuned in with them, right? So what I'm going to talk about, inshallah, today is really what I call the prophetic wisdoms of how we engage our children and how we talk to them. And I put together here seven steps. Seven steps in which if we follow them, inshallah, I hope, it'll be much easier to engage them and to do this in a way that we're actually tuning into their grief and our own as well and providing healing, Ya Rabbi. The first thing is to not shy away from all of this. We all, either last night, I know I received the news late last night and many of you have received it as well last night or early this morning, you will look up to the news of a horrible massacre and tragedy that happened. For many people, this is how we started our day here in the U.S. And um, the shying away from talking about difficult topics in general, whether they're tragedies or not, is very common. But the only issue is children are very perceptive and they pick up on little snippets of conversations and they pick up on your emotions and what's happening with you. And they know when something isn't fully right. <laughs> the problem is if it all stays really hush-hush, all they're getting is news from uh, sources other than you, which means they're getting news from potentially sources that are not very accurate or are very alarming or scary. I have to ask you, and I know we were talking about this earlier too, how many of you had the unfortunate uh, circumstance of pressing on a video that showed the actual massacre happening in real time? SubhanAllah, and why people would forward this? 
It kept going around and around and around on Facebook and WhatsApp and all these other places. And people kept deleting it and deleting it. And people kept forwarding it. And I thought to myself, clearly this is what this deranged man wanted to happen. He wanted to show like it was some sort of video game taking down people. And here we are forwarding this and exposing ourselves to the actual massacre live, right? And who knows how many of our teens have also, since they're on, many of them are on social media and are tweens, how many of them saw this too and what effect it had on them, right? So what I'm going to talk about is really the seven steps and how number one is that it starts with us. It's actually not about our children at all. It actually starts with us. So what do I mean by that? Number one is us unplugging from social media. When you are constantly watching the updates on your uh, feed, constantly, and watching every update that comes in, and I know the curiosity, I mean, some of us couldn't stop doing it too, of seeing, and it went from like nine victims to 20 to 25 to, you know, the numbers just kept rising, rising until it reached practically 50. And that, you know, the angst that came with that and the live, you know, watching it live, it's, but the problem is, what does, what effect does it have on you? And each one of us copes differently, and each one of us has a certain amount of resilience built into us. So to know yourselves, and to center ourselves, first and foremost, and to process our own emotions, and sometimes that we need to actually reach out to the people we trust. This could be your friends, your family, this could be your therapists, this could be professionals. It really depends on what uh, type of uh, resources you have in your life, and I'll get back to professional resources in a little bit. Well, when disasters strike us, it's really important to know that the little ears <laughs> in the house are listening too. And if at the very least they're reading our facial expressions and they can kind of see that something is really off. So starting with ourselves first and foremost and processing. And if you need more time to process, maybe some of you haven't had the chance, the kids went off to school in the morning, you found out maybe a little bit later, and the kids really till this point in the day maybe still don't know. And so if you found that you haven't actually spoken to the children yet, and we'll talk about age groups soon, but to process, to take the time you need to process first, as long as you're able to get back to reassuring them. Because what they really need is security and reassurance that they are going to be safe and that they're going to be okay. I know for many people hearing this, they're saying, how do we know? We have no idea if somebody storms in right now. How do we really know? And I Chef Rami will address this point about masjid safety and security and the security of our, fam of our families and our communities inshallah, in the second part of the talk. But the reality is there's a certain amount of tawakkud, right? Reliance on God that has to happen in order for us to be able to move on. Number two is preparing. So now you realize your child has heard about the news or is likely to be exposed to it, and so now you need to prepare yourself. Rather than just sort of jump into the conversation, take a step back and figure out what is it that you're trying to convey. Because figuring out what you want to convey, which really should boil down to the values that you have from the faith and from your family, and how that there is a learning lesson to come out of all of this, that you have it all together before you start to discuss with them. Because you don't know whether in the moment your, your grief and your own angst is going to come and show itself, which is only natural and normal, but the message will get lost, right? So if you want the message conveyed properly, it's as much as possible to prepare ahead of time. Also, how you talk to a five-year-old isn't how you'll talk to a 15-year-old. There is a different way of talking that needs to be age-appropriate. We see that in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. When he was talking to the young boy, he spoke to him like a young boy, right? He came to his level. And for many people in the room, we have children of different ages and at different developmental ages. And if that's the case, one of the key criteria here is to do what? To start with, maybe bringing the whole family together and starting at the level of the youngest of them, <laughs> right? Whatever the youngest level is, starting there. And let me tell you what I mean. So let's say you have different ages, because step number three, after step number two being preparing, step number three is what? Inquiring, to inquire. Figure out what they know first. Well, in the inquiry process, you'll realize that in the younger age groups, if they don't know, you don't need to share. 
They don't need to be exposed to horrific news. They're in their own little bliss of childhood, let's say, and they don't need to be exposed to this. But if they're going to, or again, they're hearing little snippets here and there, then it is time to actually discuss with them that how you speak to the different age groups will differ. So we'll say, from ages three to six, avoid. Just avoid the conversation altogether unless you think that they actually have heard or have been exposed to this conversation. Three to six is very young, so we're talking preschool, kindergarten age, right? And if they have been exposed, maybe it's because they asked their older sibling something and you knew of it, or maybe while they're playing, they mentioned something related to shootings, right? Something like that that cued you in that they may have knowledge of it. And at that point, you go to them and you actually ask a very general question like, what's upsetting you? What's on your mind? Right, like that, where you're asking a very little level, right, of how they're actually doing in order to know what's happening. The next age group up, which is a 7 to 12, this age group we say basically, wait until they ask you. You don't need to voluntarily go and tell them the news either. Because still, for the most part, they're generally in their bubble. But if you sense that they know, or will know because they're going to go to places where they're going to hear about this, or maybe some of them as young and I, you know how I feel about them having, you know, <laughs> these items right in their uh, tips of their fingers, but many of you have, many of the children here have um, access to social media in this age group. And if they do, then certainly they're going to have heard or seen even some of this. And at that age, there's, you know, you actually um, want to talk with them and see what they know. And if they're not willing to talk, there's signs that show. And some of those signs are things like, you know, regression. They start acting more immature, more clingy, you know, whereas before they weren't so clingy. Or, for example, they're not wanting to get up and go to school. Or maybe coming to the masjid. They don't want to come. They heard it happened in the masjid and they don't want to come here. They're not saying anything to you, but they're acting in a way that cues you in, that they know and they're fearful and they're scared, right? For teens, just assume they know. You don't even need to ask. Just assume they actually know, but don't assume that they have all the details. Because if we know anything about this age group, they like live off of memes, right? And so things that come to them are like in little snippets, little snippets, right? And it's not the full picture. So if that's the case, you as the adult in their family, in their life, needs to fill in the blanks and to correct the information that may be missing. That's what your role in that age group will be. And uh, many of us may also, some of us here may also have children with developmental delays or disabilities. And for that age, for that group, I would say to speak to them at their developmental intellectual level, not at their age group. And to be as straightforward and clear in your discussion as much as possible, you know your child the best at that point. Number four, to listen. So you notice so far you haven't said much at all beyond maybe an inquiry. So far, you've been preparing yourself, right? You've been uh, working on your own self. You've been preparing what to say. You have been inquiring, so a question, and now you're gonna be listening. You've said very little up until this point, and that's purposeful. The listening is because then you're able to figure out what's actually important and what's on their minds, so you don't actually project onto them your adult fears. Maybe you're terrified that someone's going to gun them down in the street, but that's not on their mind at all. Maybe they're more worried that someone's going to call on the name at school that has to do with like New Zealand. I mean, they, you, don't, you know, however they rationalize and think about things maybe so differently, and their anxieties may be so differently than ours as adults. So to really to listen, to understand where they're coming from, what's running through their minds is really important here ultimately, in order to help them and to help fix whatever the issues are. Here again, I want us to cue into nonverbal communication. So much happens nonverbally. It's not even said. But you see in the interactions and the reactions of children what's happening. And also know that children may take them a few days. They may keep on coming to you and talking to you or wanting to ask you questions day after day after day until they finally process it. Whereas for you, maybe it took you the 24 hours and you were good. For them, it may be several weeks, and that's important, several days, maybe even weeks. 
but that's important to understand as well. Number five, to validate. Still very little speaking. Validation is what we saw the Prophet ﷺ do in his hadith, in his interaction with Abu Umayr, where he validated him without blaming. He essentially, in the, in the question and the way he asked it, there was a validation in that this is okay, it's not your fault. Hence his using, what did the bird do? And not, what did you do to the bird? This concept of validation is really important. And to open up the conversation with something like, what are you upset about? What's on your mind? Things like that, very open-ended questions. And once the child responds, whatever they say, to validate it, even though it may not be what you think, or maybe if you think it doesn't even make sense. But instead of saying to them, that doesn't make sense, or don't worry about that, those are minimizing reactions. Rather, validating is to do what? Validating is to say something like, it sounds like you're feeling fill in the blank. Maybe they sounded angry or frustrated or confused or whatever the emotion was, fill in the blank. And I understand that. So you put no judgment onto it. You just explained, you just explained to them that you heard and validated them. Now, maybe what they said seemed really off from what you expected them to say. There's no judging here. You're just listening so that you can figure out how to actually help them, right? And, um, you know, we try really hard not to minimize them. And children have a really hard time sometimes finding the vocabulary. And honestly, us as adults, we do the same. <laughs> finding the vocabulary to explain our emotions. So this is where the adults need to actually help the children, the youth. To say, to be able to say things like anger, upset, confusion, frustration, fear, right? What is it? Disgust? Like, what is it that's happening with that person? To help them label the emotion is really important and part of validation. Number six. Now here finally, finally comes the speaking. This six, I call this correct uh, simplify and correct. Simplify and correct. Why? Because children, especially young ones, they tend to kind of have very rich fantasies and ideas, and they have a really hard time uh, with abstract reasoning. And especially when something's far away and they haven't seen it firsthand, and they're not really sure, but people keep talking about a massacre and massive death, and somebody came into a message, it's like really hard to fully like grasp what exactly was happening. And if the first things that they're going to tie it to is the last movie or cartoon or whatever they watched that had, or a video game that had similar things to it. And then they start, it's really hard for them to figure out what's fantasy from what's reality. Like pulling that apart is really hard. So our role, again, as the adults in the, in the, in the issue here, is to be able to simplify the issue. And to be able to say things, and I'll tell you exactly what you could say when they hear something like the mass shooting, to say something like for little children, to say a very confused and angry person took a gun and shot people. And the police are working to make sure that people are safe and that won't happen again. Your six-year-old, your, even your 10-year-old, doesn't need to hear really more than that. It's that simple of a message where you don't over, um, over explain. The over explaining actually causes more trouble and more problems. And many of you as parents of young children, you'll know, they'll come ask you a really complicated question about something and you give them like what you think is like a half an answer and they're like, okay, and they move on, <laughs> they run away, right? And so the reality is not to minimize what our children, every child's at a different level, but especially the little children, what's really important here is that you try to clarify what's fantasy from what's reality. And that's what's needed at that stage. Very different than our teens. Very different than our teens or tweens who need actually more in-depth conversation and to really sink your teeth in a little bit more. Um, and it's more likely that they actually heard news from unreliable sources, right? Because they're much more, they have friends, they have social media, they have other types of news, other types of media that they have been exposed to other than you. So this, what do we do with them? Well, with them, 
we say here, accept their sources of information. Now, you may be really upset with whatever friend told them X, Y, or Z that you don't agree with, but instead of shaming that friend or saying, bad friend, you know, that's not very useful because for the kid, that's their friend, and what their friend tells them must be truth, right? So <laughs> instead of getting into an argument about the friend and losing the point of the conversation, Rather, accept whatever the source is that they got the information from, but rather teach them what? To think critically, to ask critical questions. That concept they can take for the rest of their life. Because every time they see a headline or every time somebody forwards a meme and they can't tell what's real and what's not, when you teach them to ask questions, the how, who, why, what, where, what's missing from this article you just read? Okay, you read all these things. What's missing? What, what part of the story is missing? When they start to think critically, they're able to then apply that and actually make use of that in a much better way that will last them much longer. Inshallah. Number seven. I said there were seven, right? Number seven is to model hope and faith. The main thing we do as parents, we are role models. We are role models for them. Now, this does not mean that you can't be angry and upset, and you can and should actually show that, but in a controlled fashion. So if you need to kind of, you know, punch your pillow a few times, do that in your room, you know, <laughs> until you get your anger under control. So you can show them controlled frustration or controlled anger, and that is okay, all right? But they also need to see from you the role modeling of hope and fear. All right, but fear, hope and faith. That's what I meant to say, hope and faith. And what I mean to say by that is that to show them that even though these are very difficult things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. And this was actually part of that plan. And as hard as it is to really um, understand that, we are not meant to understand everything that comes our way. Here is where we start drawing on all the sources of faith, from our faith, from our deen, because we're taught that even from the most difficult and most ugliest and the most negative and evil of things, good can emerge. Khair can emerge. I'm looking at this table back here that's full of flowers. Full of flowers. And I've seen posts and, you know, come through and pictures and somebody sent a post, I think, on our Rahma woman's thread about some man who Googled the nearest masjid and brought a bouquet of flowers. He found a masjid in Mopitas and he just brought some a masjid of bouquet of flowers, you know. Out of the ugliest of things, you find the most beautiful things emerge too. This is what our faith teaches us. It also teaches us that in this dunya, hayat dunya, there's always going to be tribulations and trouble. Not that we're waiting for the every second that it's going to happen, but we know in the back of our minds that things are going to eventually happen, and we don't just lose faith and get angry with God. Rather, we look at the different ayat that we have, which I'll share some of them with you. You know, inshallah, the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah that talks about being tested, right? So you know that. We know that the translation of that, and certainly we will test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits. This is known. It's going to happen. We pray for our protection, the protection of our families and our ummah. But this is part of hayat dunya unfortunately, as well. And it's something that Allah reminds us of. But He also, also immediately reminds us, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah will not burden a soul more than it can bear. So where there's something about if the news has reached you, and we're, like Sheikh Rami said, remote from where this is happening. Imagine it was our own community, we'd be having a very different conversation right now. But this far away, yet close enough, right, there is this sense of this is something that's going to, um, that Allah says that we will, he will not burden a soul more than it can bear. There's a certain amount of forbearance that he is giving to all of us with this news. I know you all know, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ And with difficulty comes ease, together. Not after, with it, with the difficulty comes the ease. And we pray, inshallah, for the ease of our sisters and brothers in New Zealand, Ya Rabbi Ya Kareem. 
And lastly, this ayah as well that I want to remind all of you as well about and myself. That there was nothing that is going to happen to us except that Allah has already ordained for it to happen. So there was something in Allah's divine plan that this was meant to happen. And it's a reminder, not a justification, not an apology, not a, it's okay, it's okay. Actually, it's not at all okay. And you're going to hear from Sheikh Rami a lot about that. It's not at all okay. But there's a part where we have to be able to what? March and move forward. Right? To march forward. And we need to do this for ourselves and we need to do this for the children that are in our care. The last little section that I'm going to share with you are kind of three common mistakes that happen. So we talked about seven tips, steps, and now we're going to do three common mistakes of what happens in communicating about tragedies to our families, to our children. And the first is minimizing. To minimize or dismiss what's happened or play it off like it's no big deal or don't why are you so sad or that's far away or these kind of comments are not actually useful at all. In fact, we learned that if things are minimized, what happens is that it ends up showing up in children in other ways. And adults too, by the way. This applies to adults very much so, and I can say this to you as a psychiatrist, that this shows up in adults just like it shows up in children when their emotions are not validated and they're minimized. What is the first step of that, or what's the first, some of the, some, or let's just say some of the um, reactions that are very common? Physical symptoms. Children start complaining, and adults of headaches, stomach aches, they can't sleep, right? There's, there's an issue that's starting to, they feel unwell. Or emotional things, they start feeling sad or anxious, depressed, fearful. Or it could be behavioral type things, like we talked about regression before, that they start acting more immature or kind of um, regress in the, the socially or with, with you at home as well. And for teens, we had a couple weeks ago a whole discussion on substance abuse. And this is something we definitely see. People, teens and adults alike, will end up coping with substances to, for their distress, to kind of relax them and help them. If they're not validating their emotion, their emotions aren't validated in any other way. And sleep, difficulty sleeping, sleeping too much, having nightmares, all these things can potentially be affected if we actually minimize. Number two, overexposure. And here's where I really want to do a plea for about the social media piece. Please, for your own sake and for theirs, there has got to be a limitation on how much they're exposed. Even you watching, if you turn on the news and you're just constantly listening over and over and over, please understand that there can be long lasting effects of trauma, even though you yourself were never in the trauma itself. We call this vicarious trauma. It's trauma that transfers from the people who actually experienced it to you through what you're watching or listening to. And when that happens, that could stay with you and actually turn into an illness, a pathological illness that needs treatment called post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, even though you yourself were never actually there. The social media or the media, any source of media, is enough to do that. Do you know that even video games can do that for children and adults? These really aggressive, violent, over and over and over and kill, 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 kill over and over and over. People don't recover. God didn't create us to do that. And so there are systems are not equipped to be like that either. And so it manifests this ways in psychiatric illnesses. So please think through what you're exposing yourselves to and them to. Right? Inshallah, please. And if you have any sort of questions about whether this is happening to you or your child and you don't know, asking a pediatrician would be a great start. Asking a mental health professional would be a great start. We have the Khalil Center here because it is locally, alhamdulillah, we have some branches and offices for professional counseling services by Muslims, for Muslims. But there's also online therapy for anybody who's watching on the live stream and wanting help and there's not an actual Muslim mental health center in your locale or individuals that you may know of. You can get, um, you can get a teletherapy help as well. 
And it, it is important that it actually happens in a Muslim context because this, this was an attack on us. It was very much an Islamophobic attack, right? But nevertheless, people who are culturally trained can also help even if they're not Muslim. The point is to get the help, inshallah ta'ala. The third of the three most common steps, so we talked about the uh, minimizing, we talked about overexposure. And lastly, I want to say find indifference. So you could have heard all the seven steps and all the three um, most likely things to cause mistakes and you have tried really hard and you were really careful and you tried everything you could and your kids still doesn't want to talk to you. They're just not interested in opening up. They don't want to. Do not make the mistake of thinking, oh, they're okay. If they have heard news like what happened in New Zealand, they are not okay. We are not okay. So don't uh, assume that because they are not speaking up that they're okay. That's a big mistake to make. Rather, give them alternatives. Maybe there's, maybe your siblings, maybe their aunts or uncles, or maybe there is a youth mentor, or maybe there is a, a mental health professional, or somebody else who they can speak to. Give them alternatives for people they can speak to. And if they're not willing to speak, and this generation is so like, you know, stuck in there you know, <laughs> all day long, then perhaps give them the crisis support lines. Right? The Khalil Center has a chat line. You open up the chat and it, you can chat with somebody, you know, in crisis support. There are others. Up in Sacramento, there's something called the Amala Hope Line, which is a phone line for teens, Muslim teens, to pick up and actually call when they're in need of support and help. And there are others, Nasiha, and there's also another one run by Muslims called, uh, online called uh, Stones to Bridges. All of these are Muslim-based, and all of these are helpful and useful. Give them alternatives if they're not willing to speak to you immediately, right? And I can't emphasize that enough. So we're all close, inshallah, on my piece and hand it over to Sheikh Rami is just encouraging us all to keep marching ahead as much as possible. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the healing to come in time. This is very raw and very open wound for so many of us and our families. There is a lot of need to make dua, but I want to say that with the children and with us, one of the main things that helps us heal is to channel all that anger and all of that frustration into actual positive results. For example, today they were telling me here at the MCC they received so many calls and emails from all of the surrounding churches and other faith groups and synagogues and other groups that have been pouring in calls and messages and saying, how can we help, what can we do? Again, there, I don't know about you, but having grown up here, I haven't experienced a time in America like that, not even after 9-11. There is something special about this era, despite how difficult and awful it's been in comparison to others, other eras. But there's also something very special that can emerge here. And if you take your anger and your kids' anger and frustration and put it towards something that's actually useful and can actually... Um, uh, turn into the hopelessness and turn it into meaningful contribution. That meaningful contribution, what it does, it actually raises the soul, it heals the soul, and also allows um, healing to actually happen. And it gives us and our children resiliency that we're going to need for the rest of our lives, and they're going to need for the rest of their lives, because may Allah protect us and our families and our communities and our ummah, but this may not be the last of this. So what we need here is the tawakkul on Allah, but also the concepts of resiliency that allows us to march forward, inshallah ta'ala. So with that, inshallah, I'm going to pass the mic and hope that inshallah Sheikh Rami can talk to us more about the pragmatic aspects of how to protect ourselves and our communities. Barakallahu feekum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As-salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. I want to begin by asking a question, and this is a question that I've been thinking about it since I heard the news last night. And the question is, why does this hit home for us? Like, why is it that Masajid all over the U.S., they're doing Salat al-Ghaib, Janazah of, in absence, uh, absentee Janazah. Why are there panels like this around Masajid? Why are there khutbahs? when in reality these type of atrocities are happening happening every single day 
It's happening every day in Syria. It's happened every day in Libya for a long time. It's happening in Afghanistan. These type of things, even attacks on Masajid, happens in Pakistan, Muslims on Muslims, happens in Yemen. These type of atrocities are not new in the dunya and to the ummah. But why is it that this one really hits home? And so that's something that I've been asking myself. Why is it that this one hits home? And there's a few things that come to mind, which is one, if you, if you saw the prime minister of New Zealand when she was making the announcement, she was in shock. And in looking into some of the data about New Zealand, for a country of 5 million, in 2017, you know how many murders they had? 35. 5 million people. So even for them, this is going beyond just the fact of Islamophobia. This is going to a fact, this is changing, something is changing in the fabric of their society. A few months ago, uh, Zahra Billu, uh, may Allah protect her and all of the work she's doing for protecting the rights of the Muslims. She said she was coming back through New Zealand and then they called, they said, Miss Billu. Um, she came up and showed the ticket. She said, do you need to see my ID? And they said, no, that's all right. You responded to your name. She's like, whoa, you know, I'm coming from America where security is at all, you know, they're not going to let you get on a plane without showing your ID. And um, so uh, then the, they got into a conversation and she said, what do you do? I work for CARE. Or what do you do with CARE? And explain what she do with CARE. We all know what she does for CARE, right? She said, the person said, oh, you wouldn't have much work here in New Zealand. That Those type of issues don't exist here. They're more open society, more welcome society, more diverse society. So for this to happen, and I, subhanAllah, I was just telling my children that story a few months ago, and we were thinking, hmm, should we move to New Zealand? Because my kids, you know, as even young kids realize the Islamophobia is there. It's a lot more than 15 or 20 years ago. Even post 9-11, the Islamophobia industry is now 17 years going, billions of dollars, and government policies, and money, and, and uh, careers are made out of this. It's a different era for, for Muslims to be growing up in the West. So this is shocking to the, to the New Zealanders. For the Muslims, and I agree that we shouldn't those, those images are very, very difficult to watch, and they are traumatic. I myself, when the Syrian war was going on for the first couple of years, I was checking the news every single day. And it wasn't just the news. I was looking at, I was digging in YouTube videos, looking for the, uh, for the journalists, you know, the independent journalists who are on the ground, who are, they're not, the, the news is not coming filtered through the corporate media. And I was seeing, and I was realizing it was exhausting me, physically. Mentally, and I had to put a stop to it. I had to say, as much as I have a care and concern for my people, I can't do this much. I need to have a, I need to know as much as I need to, so that I can be concerned with them and do whatever I can. But we were not created to just be bombarded by these images all the time. Think of a thousand years ago. Think of when the Crusades were going on, and these type of atrocities were going on all the time. Muslims on other parts of the Ummah. They might have heard about it in a caravan, in a poem that was written about it, in a story, in a chronicle. They didn't have the images, live images on their phone all the time. And what happens for the human being when they see that, and Dr. Rania mentioned about the vicarious trauma, you're going to be traumatized to a certain degree, like a much smaller level of what those people, but if you watch the masjid and it happened, you you got a small part of that trauma, as if you were there. And they've recently found there's a, element of the brain called the mirror neurons and it happened they found it when they were watching monkeys and one of the scientists was eating an ice cream and the part of the brain in the monkey that experiences pleasure lit up and he wasn't eating the monkey wasn't eating the ice cream but he saw them then they started looking to looking into it so for people who watch a lot of that violence the brain it's mimicking for that person and they're getting a reaction in the brain as if they were doing it too and so this is where we get also the tradition of not only lowering the gaze from the opposite gender, but lowering the gaze from things that are haram. If it's haram to do, like those police beatings that are put all over the internet, yes, we need to be aware of it, but if people watch it all the time, they're watching other people do haram. And so the brain is mirroring that at one, at, at, at one level. But back to the question that I was asking myself, and I'm sure others were asking, why is it 
that this particular incident affects us more than others. Because there's atrocities in other countries that are documented, maybe not Facebook live stream, but they're documented. And there's atrocities in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan and, uh, and, uh, and, and in Burma and in Yemen. I mean, we can go on and on and on. And if you go back to other countries in Vietnam and in South America and what um, the US and other countries have done around the world. But why is this one different? And I thought about it, when you look at those masajid, it's a masjid of Muslims who are immigrants in the West. That's us. The way the masjid looked, for any of you who saw, the carpet was not much different than the carpet that we're sitting on here. The way the masjid was set up was what we're familiar with. All the elements of the masjid is what we're familiar with. And we're living in the West. New Zealand, Australia, Europe, North America, this is the West. And now we're feeling it coming home. Malcolm X, rahimahullah, got in trouble when John F. Kennedy was assassinated and he got suspended from the Nation of Islam because what did he say about the assassination? The chickens come, came home to roost. And the West has exported atrocities and mass murder and killing and they've exported it and they've sanitized it for their own public's viewing of it and they've distanced it from us, but now it's coming home. Now it's coming on their, on, on the West soil. That either on their watch through the UN and through all of their coalitions, that they've seen things happen and now things are coming home. And it doesn't make it any easier, but now, now we have to deal with it. And for the Muslims, you put this on top of the Islamophobia, and so it's now, we have a heightened awareness of, oh, could somebody walk through that door right now and do that to us? That's the question that we're thinking, and that's traumatic for us to have to, to have to deal with it. So for a long time, we were like Musa alayhi salam living in the palace of the Pharaoh. Musa alayhi salam was from Bani Israel, but was he experiencing the trauma and the oppression of the Bani Israel who were out there in the fields as slaves? He wasn't. He, was, he had the protection of the Pharaoh's palace. We as Muslims in the West, we have the protection of the Pharaoh's palace. And so we're allowed to develop within the palace like Musa was, to, was able to develop because he did not have the same oppression that his, that his people were being affected by. And that's what we're, we're now seeing. The oppression has entered the palace. And now, and our children can see that. And they see, they hear the conversations. And so now, how are we, what are we going to do? I have a friend who said today that he mentioned, he asked his kids, as Dr. Rania said, you know, one of the, 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 the methods are don't necessarily say, okay, kids, we have to have a talk. Let me tell you everything that happened. Just ask them, so what do you think? One of his kids, his son, said, well, you know, I'm glad that they're shaheeds. At least they got their shahad. They're shaheeds. And for a Muslim, we have to remember this is a very powerful coping mechanism for us. It's a healthy coping mechanism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the status of the shaheed. And there are three kinds of shaheeds. There's the shaheed of the battlefield. And then there's who's sincere and he gets the reward that he or she gets. There's a, there's a shaheed of the battlefield who was not sincere. And on Yom Al-Qiyamah he's asked, what did you fight for, for the sake of Allah? No, you fought for the dunya. And so people say you were brave and you fought for your country. You did not fight for the sake of Allah. You may have experienced and been benefited as a shaheed of the dunya. People regarded you as a shaheed of the, dunya, uh, the, the battlefield, but you don't get the reward of a shaheed in the akhirah. There's a third type of shaheed, and that's a shaheed who, in this dunya, we give them the janazah. And we bury them as we bury citizens who did not die on the battlefield, but they get the reward of the shahada in the next life. And those, Imam al-Qurtubi in his book, Al-Tadhkira, which is talking about death and everything that happens beyond death, he mentions from hadith about 30 different types of shaheeds. One of them is the person who dies on Friday. One of them is the person who dies oppressively. And all of those 49 people were killed oppressively in the masjid on Yom al Jum'ah. So they got their shahada. But at the same time, even though we say, Alhamdulillah, they got their shahada, it comes with a huge cost. And it doesn't mean that we become, uh, uh, that we become uh, pacifists or we just, we don't react to anything in the future. We don't, we don't, but we say, Alhamdulillah, for the past, one of the ways that we're going to deal with that was we're going to say that person is a shaheed. And I've seen myself when I've uh, consoled families 
And if one of, if, if their, dead, uh, their, 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 their loved one who died, if they were one of those 30 categories, and I mentioned to them, do you know this about the Shaheed of the Akhirah and so forth? And it just, it removes this huge weight off their shoulders. And that's something that, you know, when the pain and the grief sets in, they can say, at least they're a Shaheed. So it is a way for us to cope, to think about that, the person's a Shaheed. But at the same time, it's the victims are not just those 49 people. There's wives there whose husbands are going home. There's husbands, uh, there's husbands who were left and now the wives are going home without their husbands, children who are going without their parents. So the ripple effects of this is going to affect not just those 49 people. This is going to last for generations. And as we know now from, um, from research that was done on the, the, the descendants of the grandchildren of the Holocaust survivors, they genetically have trauma of their grandparents and grand great grandparents, the epigenetics, and, and it affects them. So the families, the people who were there are going to be affected and generations now are going to be affected. The, the people who survived or the people who lost, uh, 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 who were injured and survived, their marriages may be affected. The way they parent in the future may be affected. Their grandchildren may be affected. So when we hear the ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when you kill a one person, it's like what? You've killed whole humanity because the ripple effects of that type of atrocity and tragedy and murder is far reaching, not just to that person. So for those communities and even in our communities, when we realize people, they may be multi, uh, 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 many degrees away from that tragedy, we have to recognize this person may be dealing with trauma. They may be dealing with some fact. We have in our community here, we have a, a large group of Afghani immigrants. We have a large group of Somali immigrants who came from war-torn countries. And now we have the Syrian immigrants who are coming from war-torn countries. And the Iraqi immigrants who are coming from war-torn countries. And we have to realize that we may be dealing with the ripple of effects with their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. One of the things a friend of mine pointed out to me, Sheikh Amin Anderson, he's a student of mine and he's currently incarcerated in prison and I call him, he's rightfully a Sheikh in what he's studied and how he teaches. But he pointed out to me something that I hadn't reflected on in the ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that when the believers go out to fight, Allah tells us that not all should go out to fight, that a group should remain in the city so that they can do what? Hmm? They can remind those other people when they came, come back. And he pointed out to me, he said, I think this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted a, a portion of our community to be unaffected by the trauma of war. And so that they could have the balance needed to help reintegrate those who experience the trauma of war. Because even fi sabilillah and li i'la'i kalimatillah for the sake of Allah and for raising the, 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 the word of Allah, what the people see on the battlefield is going to change them forever. And so when they come back into the society, they need people who were, for lack of a better word, in a bubble. Dr. Rania was mentioning that, you know, to allow the children in your house, you don't have to tell them everything. That there's a certain level of innocence and bliss that they, that they have and you have to, it doesn't mean that you always keep them in that, but recognize that we see this lesson in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not everybody needs to experience that trauma. Some people will because it's a necessary thing that we have to do to protect the, 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 our lands and the believers and so forth, but not everybody has to have that. And so when we think about this, we even find it in the Sunnah. And I'll give a few examples. In a few months, we'll have millions of people going to Hajj. And then everybody sees how, they, how the men wrap their ihram. Has anybody ever thought about why? Why do we leave a shoulder uncovered? Why is that the sunnah? And some of the people, men, you'll see them have two, they're both of their shoulders covered. Imam Malik was of the opinion that you cover both of the shoulders. He said because that early stage of the believers needing to show their strength is over. He said the reason for the sunnah of the men showing their arms is so that they could show what physical abilities they have. So when they go from Medina into Mecca and these oppressive people look out there, they know, okay, if we fight them, look at all those muscles. 
Literally, like now they say, like he's flexing, like he's showing his muscle. That's literally what the ihram is there to do. To say, if you are going to mess with the believers, this is what you can expect. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that they were showing, we're peaceful, we're law-abiding citizens like, like Malcolm X rahimahullah said, but if you back us into a corner, we'll send you to the cemetery. Those were the words of Malcolm X. Another thing the Sahaba did was they, they actually had their weapons on them all the time. They even went to sleep with their weapons. Why? Because they were in a state of hyper-village vigilance that they could be attacked at any time when the community was still young. And there wasn't the security of walls and fortresses and armies and an expanded frontier. No, this Medina was a very small city. So they had their weapons with them all the time. And we have to think about this hypervigilance that even they say, for example, it affects the brain development like, like little children who are in societies that have a lot of trauma or in households that have a lot of violence. Their brain actually develops to be able to react to that trauma or the possibility of that, of that trauma. And they develop more on um, uh, 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 nonverbal cues. So as an example, if a child comes from a violent home, they grow up and one of their survival mechanisms is that their brain has developed to like look at like the flinches of the person and to not think too much about the words, but to be able to read the body language. So what happens when that child goes to a school and the teacher's like, gets mad at him, sit down in your chair and listen. What is that child seeing? They're seeing all the verbal cues of, cues of their abuser and they can't react. They go into one of the, uh, one of the, the body's reactions when it's, it's fight, flight, or what? Hmm? Freeze. That's another one, people. And I'm going to talk about that. Fight, flight, or freeze. And so this is something that, uh, that they mentioned that, that the teachers have to, they have, um, uh, they call them trauma-informed schools. There's a, uh, there's a, um, um, there's a sister in Southern California. She has a, I can't remember, I think it's called Seeds Community Project, but they do training to have trauma-informed classrooms. So this is something that we have to think about as more refugees come into our communities or those communities now, the community in New Zealand, all of those people that were directly affected, those children, their education, the, educa the educators around there need to understand education and trauma and how this is going to affect their learning because now their learning could be affected. And you see again the, the ripple effect. The Sahaba would, would have their swords with them all the time, hypervigilance. And it's, it's not necessarily the optimum state, and we see this because there were times when the Prophet ﷺ, and they would wear them in their prayer. When they would go to prayer, they would have their weapons with them. And the Prophet ﷺ, in a, there's a chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, the, the chapter of the Prophet ﷺ, forbidding people from wearing their weapons on the day of Eid. Now why do you think he would, he would, he would uh, tell people, don't wear your weapons on the day of Eid? In other words, this is not a day when we have to be thinking about those possible realities. Let's have this as a day of, of joy and let's, let's be removed. Let's be in that state of that bliss or that bubble for a few days of Eid and then we can go back to the reality of we have to have our weapons with us so that we can have um, work towards a secure society. But it's in that secure society that we can develop. That we can, if we're always now on hypervigilance, we're not going to develop. Our brains aren't going to develop. Spiritually, we're not going to develop. We have to move towards security. So in, in a, now as we deal as a, as a Muslim community in the West, in the anti-Islam rhetoric, the Islamophobia industry, and the, 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 the fact that there could be copycats, what do we do in our communities to make sure that this does not happen again? Because there are three ways to react to things or to deal with issues, whether it's the issues of addiction in our community, mental health, uh, addressing mental health issues, um, the, the, the needs of education, whatever. There's prevention. We can prevent a problem or work towards preventing a problem. There's an intervention. And then there's a postvention. So what we're doing here now is more postvention work. Now we're saying after the fact of this, that this has happened, now let's have panels, let's have uh, janazas. Some people are doing dhikr, some people are doing vich. Whatever people are using to, they want to do something to react. But what I, what I caution us as a community is to, is to A, not be merely reactionary. 
And I spoke with a brother who's in security today, and he said what he sees as a trend is that every time something happens in the world or to a house of worship, the massages all get up and, you know, oh, let's do something, let's do something, and then what happens afterwards? It goes back to normal. So that's reactionary. Where is the sustainability? What are we actually doing to, to have sustained addressing of this issue and preventing of this issue in the future? The other thing is to not perpetuate a mentality, whether it comes out in our words or the way we act or react, but we cannot perpetuate a, a, um, uh, a feeling and a, um, a state of being victims. No matter what type of oppression the Sahaba were, they held their heads with izzah, with dignity, and with honor, no matter what they were faced with. And so now we have to say going forward, how are we going to make sure that our children hold their heads up high with izzah, like the friend who I mentioned earlier when he asked his son, he said two things. He said, they're shuhada, and he said, and the other, his other reaction, I can't wait to go to the masjid tonight to show them I'm not afraid. And I said, mashallah, you raised a man. His daughter asked him, his, her reaction was, what, what type of security will they have at the masjid? And it's a, it's a valid and warranted question. What type of security will they have at the masjid? But again, not just reactionary, not just if you saw the, the pictures of the New York Police Department. Guard, anybody see those pictures of the New York Police Department guarding the masjid? That was pretty impressive. But in a couple of months, we're going to check back. And that's all going to be gone. One thing I can say about the Muslim community in New York is that they have volunteer patrols. Anybody familiar with this group? Check them out. It's, if you just type in New York Muslim Patrol, I have their um, volunteer. And you can donate on their website for a patrol car, $32,000. Radio, $350. A camera. And it's all volunteer. Uh, what are they called? Muslim. Okay, it's Muslim Community Patrol. And all they do, not armed, just uh, observe and report. Um, Okay, I'll mention and I'll, and I'll end on this, but um, FEMA has a brochure, I looked this up, FEMA has a brochure on how to respond to active shooters. And as unfortunate as it is, the reality is, is now that public schools are having these type of trainings, right? Universities are having these type of trainings. Um, maybe 100 years ago in San Francisco, or maybe say 120, do you think they did earthquake preparedness and earthquake drills? No. Did they have all of the, the city policies on how to, you know, uh, building codes and so forth that they have? No. No, they had to go through tragedy after tragedy before now the fire codes and the building codes and the evacuation codes and the earthquake preparedness and all of that. Well, now it's just a new reality of our lives that we also have to have along with that list, making sure that our bookshelves, which I don't think those are earthquake um, uh, uh, safe, uh, but our bookshelves are earthquake safe, but our massage are also and our communities are ready for active shooter, as sad as it is. We know that the Prophet Sallallahu said that one of the signs of the end of times is he said, Al-Haraj, Al-Haraj. They said, what's that? He said, it, it's killing. It's just rampant and senseless killing. It makes no sense whatsoever. The man who did the thing in New Zealand had all of this stuff scribed all over his, all over his weapons names of crusaders and crusader battles and all of this stuff. The crusaders weren't doing exactly what he did. They were actually going out onto the battlefield and facing off with Muslim warriors who were ready and willing to fight on the battlefield. Now, did they do atrocities in the cities? Yes, but they didn't do this type of cowardly things. So he's not, uh, he's far away from what he's trying to be. But FEMA has a, a, um, um, a, a brochure. And I want to call our attention to this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضُهُمْ بِبَعْضُ لَهُدِّمَتْ صَوَامِعُ وَبِيعُ وَصَلَوَاتُ وَمَسَاجِدْ If it were not for the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within human beings, some will repel others, the synagogues and the temples and the churches and the masajids would have been destroyed. Allah is calling our attention to the fact that one of the things that creates security in the land so that you can have houses of worship is that there are people who will push back. The reason why we don't have these type of things all the time is because we have security and there's police force and there's, there's rules and there's laws and so forth. And so that's preventing a lot of that. 
But now the question that we have is, what do we do that could be more? Um, in terms of dealing with the actual situation, so postvention is this type of things, education, how are we going to deal with it? Now, in, uh, prevention, now we have to talk about prevention, but FEMA, the FEMA article is about intervention. And this is where our discourse needs to change. We have to have these type of discussions about in our message. As, as, a, few, as a few things, that one of the things they mention is they say it's just like the fight, flight, or freeze. They say flee, hide, or fight. Flee. If you can find a way out, you move out. And now I'm only going over this in a few minutes. We really have to have something to where there's an actual training. And I'm reaching out to a brother who might be able to, to do this. I know they have, they've had this at Tetlib. They've had it at, at Zaytuna. Every masjid should have this preparedness. Just think of la qadr Allah, may Allah forbid. But if we had to evacuate through that door and that door, I mean, look at the way we park. Look at the way we have our shoes. We have to have a lot more discipline in our massage to figure out how would we respond. Would, do we know how to flee the masjid? Are we preparing that? I know the Sunday schools, they have the fire drills and they have the earthquake drills. Well, now we have to add, okay, how are we going to evacuate in, in the need of an emergency? One thing that I'll say for men and Muslim men, it's women and children first, just like on the ship, right? Women and children first. That door and those doors, there's only two exits. It's very little. If we try to evacuate two or three hundred, now we need the experts to come in and say, I'm not an expert on how that happens, but this is what we need to be discussing. So flee or hide uh, or fight. And this is what I'll end on. The Sahaba were thinking with their weapons on them all the time. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam having to tell them, okay, guys, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Astaghfirullah. All right, men, on the Yom al Eid, put your weapons down. But other than that, there was one time where there was a loud sound in Medina and the Sahaba all came out to re respond. Who was the first one to respond and had already grabbed his armor, his weapons, and he was on his horse outside of the outskirts of Medina? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Umar and some of the other Sahaba went out to see what it was, he was already coming back. He said, it's okay. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was willing to put himself first. But we have to have this, we have to have this in our in our khutbas. We have to have like the mention, look at the stories of the seerah. A lot of the seerah are about the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. Even though that was not the majority of his life. But what is it creating in the believer? It's creating in the believer that yes, we are peaceful people, we are law-abiding people, but we are also a martial people. We are a martial people in the sense that we will the flee the flee, hide, or fight, some of us have to be putting the fight first. When we line up for prayer, we line up in lines just like soldiers. And when there's a line, when there's a, when there's a hole in the line, what happens? We move forward. La qadr Allah. But all it would take is a few people to rush a person. Just a few people. Yelling at the top of their lungs, Allahu Akbar. I have a friend of mine who we met, remember the Tunisian brother who came uh, to Mauritania? On the way he left France, he didn't know any English, uh, any Arabic. He went to Maur Mauritania, he wanted to study the deen. He got in France, a pickpocketer took about six or seven hundred of the dollars that he had. That was his, all his money. So now he's in a country that's not his country. He's French of Tunisian origin. He's in Morocco on the way to Mauritania. He's in a train station. He sees the thief running away with his six hundred dollars. That's it. That's all his money. What did he do at the top of his lungs? Allahu Akbar! The thief literally turned around, dropped the money, and left. It's powerful. So, it's not, you know, people joke and they're like, you know, now they have these jokes where they, they, should, they have these guys where they're, uh, anyway, it's a serious discussion. But, you know, people joke about it like, oh, the Muslims are going to say Allahu Akbar. Yeah, we're going to say Allahu Akbar. Um, and so I'll end on that, that this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that one of the things is, is that in the human beings, it's re people repelling other people. And so if we have to be re ready, la qadar Allah, that if something like that were to be happened, how are we going to react? And how are we going to react, uh, have in our masjid? One of the things that we see constantly in the Quran is the, is the concept of ribat. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu. Do riba. 
And the ribaq there that's talking about it, and the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, he said, the ribaq, it's better than Ray Laylatul Qadr. Being on the frontier, guarding the, 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 the borders of the Muslims, the real border patrol, guarding the border of the Muslims, it's better than Laylatul Qadr. It's better than fasting the whole year. It's better than this, and better than this, and better than this. But that's on the frontier where they needed people to, to help out. It can also be brought into the masjid. One of the forms of ribat is waiting for a salat ba'd a salat. If you sit here and you pray maghrib, like some of you have prayed maghrib and jama'ah here, when you wait until isha time, that is a form of ribat. So it's not the frontier ribat that those hadith are talking about, but it is a form of ribat. And who do we have in the masjid who have that mindset to have the ribat in the masajid? Do we have that? We have da'wah committees, and Taraweeh committees, and Jum'ah committees. Do we have, and I'm not talking about MCC, I'm talking about Masajid across Canada, the US, the UK, France, Australia. Do we have within our Masajid security committees? I'm asking the committee here. We don't. What? What's that? Okay, MCC does, but it's not as active. But we, I mean, this is something we need to develop, and it's not something, I'm, I'm just putting it out there. But if we look at other communities like the Nation of Islam, they had the fruit of Islam. And they didn't have a lot of issues with their masajid. What's that? They never had issues. But they had specific people that were in charge of the riba, of the security of the masajid. Unfortunate as it is, we can't, we are no longer in an age where we can have our, our, our masajid like the day of Eid at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and we have to come to terms with the fact that this is one way that we have to uh, be going forward. Um, I'll end there, I know it's close to Isha time. What's that? And um, Jazakumullah khair, and may Allah bless the MCC community for all that they're doing for, for the community and all of the neighbors and the local law enforcement and anyone who's, uh, who, who's, who's, who's helping out in, in, in organizing, even if it's uh, watching the traffic on Saturday, on the Sunday schools and but we have a lot of children at the, the, the programs here. I, for the last 24 hours, I've been thinking about my kids in this masjid. Raise your hand <clears throat> for the parents who are thinking about that. Because it might be one thing if I can book it and run out of this masjid, but is my two and a half year old son gonna be able to do that? Are my kids gonna be able to run out? So we have to, and then I'll, I'll, the other thing is, I, I know some of the reaction is about um, uh, at the policy level and people are directing it towards, you know, uh, presidents and so forth. And yes, we do have to have that conversation. There are certain policy issues and people that are, are saying things and, and the destabilization of some of our, of our countries that has caused immigration and the, uh, the, the, the corruption in some of our countries that has caused immigration. People have to, have to look for work outside of their country. There's a lot at the global level. I'm spe I spoke more about the, the, the community level, uh, but I will end on this. We don't need the tweets of those presidents or those former presidents because the reality is they have a lot more blood on their hands than this guy does. So I don't need his pretty face sending out tweets and it doesn't make me feel any happier. On that note, mashallah, I want to share and end here with a couple of resources. Those who are with us in the masjid tonight, there is a therapist here, actually a couple of them, Mashallah, we had one who's been all evening with the youth, with the teenagers, working with them. But there is another therapist who, will, inshallah, will be in the conference room. And this is free of charge. Mashallah, she's fully volunteering her time here. May Allah bless her. For anybody who feels that despite everything we've talked about, there is still a lot of angst that they're covering. This is just, you know, Mashallah, uh, pro bono for you to make sure that you leave here tonight in the best shape you possibly can. So please do make use of that service. Um, and that will be in the conference room. If there are others who uh, want and need assistance after this, inshallah, our table back is at the back there for the Khalil Center. You're welcome to speak with us as well and set up any appointments going forward. Online resources, in terms of the talk that I gave earlier, the seven steps and then the three, I want to let you know that that is something um, that I'm inshallah will be published in just another day or so on Muslim Matters. So if you didn't get to write all the notes down or wanted to know, you'll find that information, inshallah, online. And there are a couple of other really great resources. I want to give a shout out to the Family Youth Institute, FYI. They have put on a really nice resource called the Tragic Event Toolkit, in which you can find a whole lot of resources about grounding yourself and really being 
um, inshallah, um, in good shape for your families. And lastly, the Muslim Wellness uh, com, they also put together a community trauma toolkit. So feel free to look up those resources. So that way we talked about local and also national resources for you and your family members, inshallah. With that, inshallah, I'm going to just close us up. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ma'ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een. We ask you, Allah, inshallah, to keep us and yourselves and the ummah and all those who have passed in your du'as. May Allah accept from them and from us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and grant them fasih jannatahu, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and help um, heal all of us and them. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha Allah. I shall